Mike, I'm to speak. Lord, please rise. Join me in reciting the pledge and then remain standing as Rodney Burris leads us in prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together again. We ask you to uh, give us peace, wisdom, uh, and the, the, the proper ideas of what needs to happen in this city. We thank you, praise you, for what you're going to do. Amen. 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 Roll call, please. Mr. Fergus? Here. Ms. Stevens? Here. Ms. Harlan? Here. Mr. Reed? Mr. Ruff? Here. Mr. Burris? Here. Mr. Kuhn? Here. We have a quorum? Thank you. Moving on, public participation. This is an opportunity for the public to provide public comment to the presiding officer of the mayor. Those wishing to speak are required to sign in prior to the commencement of the meeting and must address the council from the table provided. Public comments must comply with Ordinance 2014-02 and be limited to five minutes or less. This evening we have John Dunn. Your turn. Oh, I was going to listen to everybody else before I stepped in. You're first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the proposed deal is one in the bowling alley area. Uh, my concerns are number one, parking, number two, the kids, no sidewalks, and them going across the road to the park. Anything else to say? No, I just want to make sure that that's, that's addressed. Okay. There's not enough parking spaces, no place for the kids to go. Very good. Thank you for your <coughs> Next is Josh Dunn. Uh, I'm going to say the same thing. So. Okay. Thank you. Fred Sikorsky. Facility, based in good faith that that was what was going to happen. 
Um, and, and variations were granted for that purpose because seniors don't generally have two cars. If you one, they don't drive very often. Um, that's not the case anymore. You're looking at, I assume, assisted living, not cold, low income. It's not really delineated out here. Is this condos? Is it apartments? Um, but now we have a different situation. You have kids. You have more vehicles. They're, that's not been addressed. And this is happening very fast. Um, I'm not seeing any studies. You said there's a study here that there's more, there's need for rent assisted living in the area. Is there some study of that that I missed? There's some talk about need for low income homes, but are these homes or are these apartments? Not, not that apartment can't be a home, but I don't know if it's a condo or a home yet that's not discussed here either. And I've seen no studies saying we needed more apartments in the area. Um, so I'm not sure where that came from. And, and in that same breath, they said there was a study about parking being done. Uh, is, does anyone have that study? Has that been professionally done? I'd like to know who completed it. You know, was it commissioned by somebody? Or does anyone have a copy of it? Because both neighbors are concerned about it. Um, so if it's published, I'd like to see it before anyone would vote on something like that. Quick summary. I find it hard to recommend a project like this in our community I just don't see it being advantageous to us. I, I see concerns and I'm not, I'm asking what is the positive to it. <coughs> when you got enough concerns and I'm not seeing a whole bunch of positives, it's hard to really recommend that. I, I do wish the person who owns the space an opportunity to, to make a living. I'm just not sure this is the right place for something like that. Or if there's a need for something like that in this community. Thank you, John. Thank you. Vic Zimmerman. Speaking today at Superintendent of Schools in Monticello, CUSD 25. My concern is related to the Emba Partners 46 unit apartment <coughs> complex. The project was originally approved as, a, as an over 55 senior apartment complex. The school district had no concern with that project as it would not add, it would add no students to our population and thus have no financial impact. Ordinance 2020 requests to change the project to a low-income apartment complex with no age restrictions. My issue has nothing to do with the low-income side of the project. However, I do have concerns related to the potential financial impact that the project will have on our school district. An apartment complex built within the school district will likely increase the number of students that attend our schools. More students are certainly fine but more students also mean more expenses, which is also fine if the students come with some additional revenue. The complex has 46 units, including one and two bedroom apartments. This could mean an additional 25 to 50 students. School districts in Illinois are generally funded with state dollars and property tax dollars. Because we receive a large portion of our state revenues from CPPRT, we will see very little, if any, additional revenue from the state for the additional students that would live in, these apartment in this apartment complex. The other major portion of our revenue comes from property taxes. While we do choose to live in a school district with a very low tax rate, our tax rate continues to be in the bottom 5% of all unit school districts in the state of Illinois. About half of the total property taxes paid in our communities goes to the schools. We will not see any additional property tax dollars from the building of this apartment complex as it currently sits within TIF 2, which, is, which was approved by the city in 2006. TIF 2 includes commercial and business properties along Market Street, extending out to the Kirby complex. Schools are rarely proponents of TIF districts, as no increased property taxes are received by the district from any new development within the TIF district for 23 years. 
That said, we do understand that TIF districts, when used correctly, serve to improve the infrastructure that allows for redevelopment to occur within those TIFs. TIF districts generally do not include residential <coughs> properties. This is currently true for Monticello TIF 2. The school district would likely vehemently oppose any residential TIF districts unless an agreement was struck in advance to make the school district whole on lost property tax revenues when students are added to the district. The original EMVA request and city approval did add a senior residential apartment complex to TIF 2, but it, as said earlier, it would not house new students. The approval of this zoning variance to eliminate the over 55 age requirement would come with a formal request from the school district, district to be made whole as required by TIF laws for the additional students living there. Assuming just 25 students, likely on the low end, at our, at our most recent instructional cost per pupil of $11,000 per student could cost nearly $275,000. Schools are fine with more students, but we need them in property tax paying houses in order to cover at least some of the cost. If the estimated increased value of the bowling alley property due to the apartment complex is $3 million, the total annual tax for the schools would be about $37,500. As stated, we will see none of it due to the TIF. <clears throat> the TIF is not supposed to be for houses or apartments. If approved, the school district would expect would at least expect the TIF to make us whole on this property since it will have an effect on the bottom line. $37,500 a year is a far cry from $275,000. Personally and obviously, I'm, I am a supporter of Monticello, and I'm a believer in growth and change. I would like to see new houses and subdivisions in and around our town. By the way, we are currently almost out of build-ready residential lots in the district. I don't like to see empty storefronts. I wish something would go into the Shopco building and the Pepsi site. I think Amazon should put a warehouse in the general cable plant. And I would even be fine with a recreational cannabis facility in Monticello or Piatt County, just for the sales tax money. All that being said, the school district is one of the main reasons why people move to Monticello, and we need to ensure that it is supported in all ways, including financially. Thank you. This project, with a, with a negative financial impact on Monticello schools, for that reason alone, I would urge the council to vote no on this project variance. Thank you very much. Dick Wilkin. Thank you. I'm Dick Wilkin, and I'm a resident here at 502 East Horseman. We have done a number of projects here in town, and every time we were held to the letter of law on all of them. <coughs> and they do not seem to be the same here. So uh, we don't appreciate this. We have, we agree with what the school said, and we agree with what Fred said. That's about all I have to say. Thank, Thank you very much, Dick. Steve Schreffler. <coughs> Good evening. I started to prepare some notes for what I would want to bring to your attention as far as this project is concerned. <clears throat> and I went to print it about an hour ago and I noticed it was over 1,500 words. I thought, forget that, I'll just add a little. For everything these other people mentioned, I could, uh, I could give you 10 more reasons for you to reject this proposal. Hopefully, all of you had the opportunity to view the video of the Planning Commission meeting that was held Tuesday night, that was Tuesday night. And in doing so, I hope you looked at it and said to yourself, is this guy credible at all? Is he telling us the truth? He's naming phantom studies, one of which he commissioned and supposedly some national firm came to Monticello and did a site survey and agreed that they only needed one parking spot per unit. And you've heard from other owners of apartment complexes in Monticello and they've all told you that two spaces is needed. And if you look around at the existing parking, at, at the other apartment buildings in town, 
you don't see gaping holes. There's not an overrun supply of parking, and they all met the standard. There's a reason why the city of Monticello has uh, a requirement of two parking spots per unit. Um, if this goes in, it's going to affect us in more than one way. One thing it'll do is take an already saturated market, I wouldn't say oversaturated, but there's never been a time that anybody's had a problem finding an apartment in myself. No apartment building owner will tell you that they maintain 100% <coughs> uh, occupancy. Most of them um, may have a waiting list, but what's going to happen is this will go in and it will prevent any other developer from wanting to come to Monticello because then we will be oversaturated um, with apartments, even though these are this is a horrible location. Um, when the first proposal came along, you'll recall that the property to the south was available. So it wasn't a matter of, oh, well, we just can't fit this in here. They could have if they bought enough land, but it's a profit thing. Keep in mind, these are out of, out of town developers, out of state developers, and um, so that means any rent that they bring in is not going to stay local, it's going to go straight to their corporate uh, offices. If there was a need for apartments in Monticello, we have a lot of intelligent developers that would have already built apartments if they thought there was a need for more. As a 30-year landlord in Monticello, I stayed away from apartments for that very reason, because the, there wasn't a need and I wanted to always maintain 100% occupancy in my, in my uh, rental units. These apartments are going to be 600 square feet. To give you an idea, a single wide mobile home, uh, a 12 by 60, is 720 square feet. This is even smaller, even smaller mobile homes. Um, and these people will cram as many people in there as, as, uh, as they can fit. It may be called a one bedroom, but it's also got a living room with a couch. Um, so, I don't know how many people are going to live in this. There is no, not enough parking for the drivers that would be there um, and their friends. And of course, when you uh, have teenagers, teenagers have friends with cars, there is going to be probably double uh, the number of parking that, that, they're, that they're proposing here. Keep in mind, the city of Monticello has rejected this type of project in recent history twice. Uh, once was a cheese factory across from the cemetery. They wanted to put, I believe it was 48 units in there. Same thing, uh, problem with egress, um, problem with parking. Um, the chief of police at the time told the city council that if you allowed this, that I, I don't remember what his percentage was, but a large percentage of police calls were going to be to that location. He could tell you that just uh, <coughs> absolute certainty from history. Not long ago, um, we also had a proposal going where the bus barn was, similar situation. Interestingly enough, uh, if you take the number of units and the, and the uh, acreage of the lot that he wanted to do, it was actually better than this one. And, uh, and you rejected that, and then he withdrew his application when he knew that he couldn't get approval. At the very least, and I think, I think you should just reject this outright, but if you are so inclined not to, then somebody, that person should make a motion uh, to table this, not, this is, a, this is an ordinance, right? So it takes a second reading. So whatever you do, don't fast track this. There's no advantage to Monticello. This developer sells this project like they always do. Then we're going to be left holding the bag. You're going to have a development here with no way, unless the city pays guns or uh, the owner of uh, the Foster's Inn a whole bunch of money to buy more parking. It's just, I could go, that was five minutes, believe me, that was less than 10% of what I could tell you. And I don't have anything whatsoever good to say about this project. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> Let's move on to the consent agenda. Uh, approval of documents and action items is listed. Claims report, claims dated January 14, 2000. 2020 through January 27, 2020. Meeting minutes, City Council meeting minutes January 13, 2020. Planning and Zoning Board meeting minutes November 18, 2019. Historic Preservation meeting minutes November 5, 2019. 
budget report December 2019 and treasurer's report December 2019. Is there a motion to pass the consent to approve the consent agenda? So Is there a second? Are there any comments or questions? Hearing or seeing none, I'd like a roll call vote, please. Mr. Kim? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Ms. Harlan? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. And Mr. Fair? Yes, ma'am. Motion passes. Thank you. Mayor's report. Uh, E-waste recycling collection is this Wednesday for uh, the 29th from 9 to 12 at Piatt County USDA office, which I think is down south, right? <coughs> south. <laughs> That's Wednesday from 9 to 12. <clears throat> the Sangamon Valley CEO bus class business Battle of the Bags will be this Saturday, February 1st at First Christian Church. There are some students from the CB CEO class here that will be presenting about the program later in the meeting. Don't forget also on Saturday this week, it's uh, Mud Puppy Day. Saturday from 1 to 4 at Monarch Brewing Company. Uh, we signed an official proclamation. This is something Ter uh, Terry went last year and said it was a lot of fun, so that's Terry talking. Just think about that. Okay, uh, moving on. The first of four early bird days will be next Wednesday, February 5th, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the municipal building. Pool passes will be sold at a discounted rate. And tickets are on sale for the annual Monticello Main Street's Chocolate Fantasy event which is next Friday, February 7th, from 5 to 30 in downtown Monticello. <coughs> Moving on to new business. At this time, I would like to uh, appoint uh, Mary Vogt as the other person in Ward 1. Uh, I think she's a very qualified candidate, very qualified person. I think she brings a wealth of knowledge to the council, and I look forward to working with her. I to entertain a motion to approve her appointment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any comments? Need a roll call, please. Miss mm -hmm. Stevens. Yes. Miss Harlan. Yes. Mr. Brock. Yes. Mr. Burris. Yes. Mr. Kim. Yes. Mr. Ferris. Yes, ma'am. Motion passes. Thank you, Mary. Will you for us to proceed now, please? <coughs> oh, yeah, actually, they're going to get sworn in right up here by Jill. Okay. of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Alderman Ward 1, of the Office of Alderman Ward 1, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Okay, moving on, uh, Sangamon Valley CEO Program presentation. Come on up. So, uh, the say, I'm going to say one more quick and then Please I'm going to say So, the Sangamon Valley CEO Program is something that just started this year. Um, it's made up of five high schools and I'm hopefully not stealing all your material. Um, but City Monticello is one of 37 investors I think we have right now. Uh, and so Lisa Shepard, who is the amazing facilitator with these students, has brought three of the eight um, to kind of share what they're doing. Great. Thanks for having us here this evening. Um, like Kelly said, I am the facilitator of Sandman Valley CEO. We are lucky to have Kelly to serve on our board and spearheading getting this 
um, program started. It has been a great inaugural year, and we have a great group of eight students. Um, it's been fun to see how much they've grown. We're in our third quarter now. Um, and really, Sigma Valley CEO is a business course in which we believe that the working professional can present the knowledge and pass that on to the students um, in the best way possible. So we've been on over 30 site visits um, to different companies. Um, we've brought in around 15 guest speakers. Uh, the students are going to tell you a little bit more about the other roles and things that we are doing in the class. So I'll have them introduce themselves and explain a little bit more to you. <coughs> um, I'm Colin Young, senior at Russell High School. Um, so site visits are three to four days a week. Um, go to different businesses uh, in the communities, go to being Sarah Gordon, Argena, um, Be Mint, Monticello. Um, and my favorite site visit this year it has to be Kirby Medical Center since it's right here in Monticello. And just seeing the corporate structures, and I learned so much just from like 90 minutes a day in that class. Um, it's something that I cannot explain. This is definitely showed me what I actually want to do with my life, my own business. And um, just seeing how professionals do their work, it's just amazing. Yeah, the combination of site visits and uh, guest speakers, like Alan said, happens three to four times a week. Uh, and learning from people that are actually out in the world doing it is, it, it's uncomparable to any other, like in classroom learning, it's, um, it's invaluable by comparison. Um, my name is Eric Chesler, senior at Monticello High School. So, um, we go on site visits, like Colin said, and at the end of every semester, we have a project which is either class business or an individual business. Right now we're working on a class business. And basically what that is, is a bags or a cardinal tournament. And it's actually um, at First Christian Church in Monticello this Saturday. And it starts at 10, I believe. Yeah. So basically, yeah, there's going to be 40-something teams, if I'm correct. Hopefully 40 teams are. Yeah, we're hoping for that.
we spend time working on first semester is our class business, and uh, that, like Eric said, that's our battle with that. Um, but second semester, it's mostly our individual businesses. So one of the unique things about this class is we're allowed, not allowed, we're encouraged, and as you see, that you're expecting to uh, start our own company and business uh, throughout the course of the class. Um, so I think next week we're really going to start hitting it pretty hard. Um, we're in the final stages of our class business this week. Uh, that will be finalized by the end of next week, and then we'll start getting into our personal businesses. So um, I started the class interested, but I knew nothing about business. Um, but now I'm confident that I like, at least have the resources to get where I need to be to start my own business. And uh, I, I know the basics, but I know there's always still more to learn. I'm looking forward to continuing to learn that. So tell us what your business is first. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> so my business uh, is a board game company. Um, some friends and I got together. We were uh, we were playing chess, and we realized that we should create our own board game. And so we did, just uh, out of boredom, I guess, more than anything. And then I figured, you know, I've got this class of business after start. I'm, I have the ability to take this and turn it into something um, profitable. So that's. So that's kind of what the program, one of the great things is it allows them those things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily take the risk and it's certainly safer to do it here where it's okay to fail as opposed to when you're out and have a mortgage and kids and things like that. Um, lots of years on the road. <laughs> but, um, you know, this program, it, it encompasses five school districts. So that's a huge community to embrace. And we can just three months sell kids, but we have um, our general Oriana, we met Sarah Gordo, also participating this year. Um, mm -hmm. They've gotten really close, and it's, it's wonderful to see that they're, you know, it doesn't just stop at 9 o'clock when the class ends. No, it definitely does not stop at 9 o'clock. What is this class for personal businesses? So, um, I like the construction <clears throat> aspect of everything. My dad was in the construction business. Um, so, I kind of wanted to do some more construction, but I also wanted to branch off of my own. And I did a job a couple years ago for my grandma's making a brick walk path for like landscape landscape stuff. It just really showed me like this is so cool and having the satisfaction of actually seeing it. So that's where I'm going on my own landscaping company, more hardscape with some softscape side. Sure. All right, so <laughs> with me in my free time, I just like making music. Uh, it's not real instruments, it's not like a computer. Uh, I know you guys are older, which is fine, but it's basically you. It's all like software based, it's not like real instruments, but this is my free time if I'm bored. I just like to go on there and just make whatever music I can. I like to make it for like whatever advertisement on radio or TV that I can get a chance of. So, so if anyone has anyone to never listen with, uh, we do website music or anything like that. That's one of the parts of those classes. I obviously do not have all the answers to their questions, but within the network of our community, we do. And uh, Eric was talking about doing something much safer, but like Callie said, <coughs> this is an opportunity that it's not really failure. It's, it's trying something and seeing how it goes. Um, we, there are real dollars and cents to it. They, for their class business, the money raised through their class business will be the seed money for their individual businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and then anything that they make with their individual businesses, they are expected to report for taxes. And But then that money that they um, generate with their individual business is theirs to take with them and help probably hopefully see their future ventures or college or whatever is next for each of the students. Um, when we did uh, our presentations to the local schools, the junior class of each local school to try to recruit more people for next year, um, one of the major concerns was, you know, what if your business fails? Well, you can't do it. And um, that was one of my concerns as well. Like, what, what happens when you, if you can't start your business? But to be completely honest, um, this class has taught me that, you know, not only failure isn't really a failure. Failure means, okay, maybe you don't make money, maybe your business runs on the ground, but you still learn from that experience. And the class as a whole understands that as well, and your grade isn't going to be affected by that. As long as you do what you're supposed to, supposed to do, and try with 
and do everything you can to get it there. If you can't get there for some reason, then so be it. That's part of the learning curve. Um, and so, and aside from that entirely, now being there, getting ready to start my own business, I'm not entirely, I'm not scared of it. I'm, I'm pretty confident that even if it does run into the ground, which I hope it doesn't, obviously, <laughs> but even if it does, I think it will be all right. And, well, that's actually what I like about it, because in the real life world, in business, that's what it's about. It's about taking risks and possibly failing, but you just have to go through that, you know? So, I see a lot of real life uh, examples of this program. I'm going to be completely honest. Um, Dr. Zimmer, no one goes. <laughs> I'm not a good student at all. I'm a C average student. <laughs> and this class brings out what I'm good at. And it's just neat to see that I, it's, Unbelievable. I have an A, so. Uh, the, the, the class isn't structured uh, the same as a normal class. Um, uh, you can be a, a C student, and um, as long as you have some work ethic, you'll be okay. Uh, there's not much memorization involved. It's all, it's just learning and trying. It's very really just real world things. And, uh, to be honest, very so not as much as people. High school students think they would be. Yes, it seems to be trustworthy, hardworking, and motivated. Um, that's what makes a great CEO student. Yeah. Can you take questions if there are? Absolutely. Yeah. Rodney, were you saying something earlier? Was that you? No, was it my, how did you settle on the bags tournament? I mean, what was it deciding? <laughs> Was there focus groups that said this could succeed? This so, could succeed. what we did, we were actually in Suzanne Wells' <clears throat> law firm, and Lisa gave us, I think, five sticky notes and said, come up with each. Each, yeah, five sticky notes each. Um, like, what do you want the class business to do? And the battle of the bags is what everybody voted on. The last, so we all wrote down five ideas, I'm sure anything we had, some of them were horrible, some of them were actually <laughs> decent. Um, and we put them all up on the wall, and then we went through, I think it was three different stages of yeah. narrowing it down, and we ended up settling on the bags tournament. Uh, we figured that was something that could involve multiple communities that people of all ages would enjoy, and you could do a little winner, that was a big thing. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Starting your own business, I mean, obviously, you talked about networking, I mean, that's going to be a key component of your success moving forward. Obviously, you're working with other schools. How's that dynamic been from when it started to when it is now? I'm sure those relationships obviously were brand new when you met them, but now they've probably developed more into, into friendships and you know, potential business partners, maybe something like that. Yeah. Um, an example, Greg and I didn't get along at the start of the class. <laughs> and now I call one of my like, really good friends I can talk to about anything. Yes, that's the way Yeah, same with me. I never really talked to any of these two guys. <laughs> Both besides football, but that's basically it. But like after that, we're just a lot closer now. And in the other schools, especially. Yeah, no, we never met any of, the, any of the people from the other schools. There's five other students. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's easy to just do your own thing when you see people outside of school and stuff, but um, being in a class that's non-conventional, uh, you're forced to talk to people. And the first two weeks were rough. They were, yeah. they, they were rough. Uh, I, I've always been a fairly social guy, so I've made an effort to talk to people, but other people in the class weren't the same way. Um, and I wasn't as social as I could have been either. Um, so you try, and, or not, <laughs> and at first you don't get along. And, just everybody does their own thing, nobody really wants to communicate uh, as much as they should. And then I think the first time we really started to like force each other to talk to each other was about three weeks in. It's a race right? course. Alright, we, 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 we did some team building within the first two weeks that helped, but I would say it wasn't the first three days. Wow. There we go, that helped. But, um, about two or three weeks in, we, we did uh, a badge business, which we had to name badges uh, to go to, actually, at least Lisa got hers with her. Um, and in order to do that, we had to figure out how to raise money. Lisa told us, she goes, here's your project. I'm going to help you do it, but you got to figure out how to make it happen. And we had no money. We had uh, nothing to do. And it can't be out of pocket. It has to be paid for from the class funds, which the class funds had nothing to do. So we had to figure out how to go, go to get sponsors, how to make a badge that would have our pictures and individual names on it. And having that first project just kind of being thrown in the deep end right off the beginning, 
uh, kind of force everybody to talk to each other and go out and we had to go with these sponsorships and force other people to actually talk to adults and uh, people that they've never met before and ask for, you know, how do you go up to somebody and ask for money, right? But we figured it out. So if you want more information on the CEO program, you can just go to SanguineValleyCEO.com um, or you can follow their Facebook um, or Twitter page. And uh, like they said, they go to a lot of site visits. They're dressed like this. They meet at 7, it's supposed to be 7.30, but they're back there by 7.15. And as you can imagine, covering um, five school districts, if you're up by Argenta, you're going to have to haul it to get down to Sarah Gordon. So it teaches a big component of responsibility. Again, it connects them to their community. Um, they learn how to dress nicely. And uh, the transformation from when they started in August to even a month in was just phenomenal. And these are going to be some great students. And, the um, best way to contact us is just come to the show on Saturday. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ordinance 2020-02, an ordinance amending Chapter 93 of Title IX of the City of Monticello Code of Ordinance is to regulate cannabis as provided in the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. Am I talking to you, John? Yes, thank you, friends. Um, as everybody knows, as of January 1st, 2020, the Cannabis Recreational and Tax Act became effective and is now legal for adults age 21 and over to possess cannabis in a recreational setting. Uh, certain preventive provisions of the act are enforceable by a civil monetary penalty. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Some of these offenses are possession by those under 21, providing false identification to purchase, uh, prohibited conduct in public places such as walking down the street uh, and partaking of recreational cannabis, and also cultivation by those who are not holding medical cannabis cards uh, that are fewer than, I think it's five plants. <coughs> uh, other offenses are for dispensaries, uh, for waste and disposal of cannabis, also for advertising uh, on-premise consumption. Um, while well, I initially was thinking on-premise consumption would, was not uh, something that we would deal with here, it can be <coughs> if a bar decides they want to allow on-site consumption, um, that's not legal for them to do. Uh, and uh, we can cite them under uh, state statute uh, at this point. Um, so while well, some of these may not be necessary uh, at this time because we don't have any dispensaries in Monticello, I believe it's important to get the ordinances in place uh, so if the time comes, we can enforce the issues at a local level. So what this will do is shift uh, any uh, fines for the <coughs> violations from going to uh, county and state to staying here in Monticello only. Uh, so that the, the money generated would be uh, city money, not county and state money. So it's recommended that the City Council discuss and pass ordinance amending Chapter 93, Title 9 of the City of Monticello Code of ordinances to regulate cannabis as provided in the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, is there a motion to uh, waive or second reading? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Can we have a vote? Ms. Stevens? Yes. Ms. Harlan? Yes. Ms. Bo? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Burris? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. And Mr. Frank? Yes, ma'am. Motion passes. Okay. And what John just said, I think, is we have control over what comes in. It, we don't have to, it doesn't pass through someone else or go somewhere else, fines, right. etc. Right. Yeah, the fines will come directly to the city. Directly to the city. <coughs> Comments or questions before I ask for a uh, motion? There's no question. Is there a motion to approve Ordinance 2020 and Ordinance Amending Copy by uh, Chapter 93? Of Title IX of the City of Monticello approved of ordinances to regulate cannabis as provided in the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. Absolutely. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Hearing the same nine, I'll ask for roll call. Mr. Brock? 
Yes. Mr. Burris. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Frayer. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Stevens. Yes. Ms. Harlan. Yes. Ms. Hunt. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you for being proactive, John. I appreciate that. Uh, now we're down to ordinance two, uh, 2020 1412 North Market Street amendment to conditional use in the area of Yes, yeah, so last year Miller Valentine uh, received a conditional use and variance for a uh, project that they were proposing at 1412 North Market Street, current bowling alley. Um, that was a four, three story, 46 unit development. Um, that would be for those age 55 and older. The conditional use that they received was to allow multifamily dwelling use in the business zone, and the variance was to uh, reduce the parking requirement of two per unit um, down to uh, 1.26 spaces per unit. Um, the council at the time, literally almost to the day this time last year, approved those requests. They have since amended their project. Uh, we would like to remove the um, component for 55 and older, um, but allow it to be open to all. They still uh, would like to market it to seniors, but remove that senior only component. And because the ordinance 2019-08 um, was initially specific to the senior housing pro uh, project, they asked for an amendment to reflect that change. Um, just for the record, if um, the city council were to deny this request, that initial ordinance still stands. So last Tuesday, uh, January 21st, the Planning and Zoning Board held a public hearing at their meeting. Um, they heard from a couple residents. One um, adjacent property owner who we heard from earlier today was concerned about parking and overflow onto the lot. In addition to that, um, there were some concerns about how there were children, whether they were playing, and so forth. Uh, after further discussion, the Planning and Zoning Board voted to recommend approval of the Conditional Use Permit and Variance Request Amendments for 1412 North Market, four yes, one no, two absent. Bill Tracy is here representing the owner, and Sean <coughs> is um, representing the developer, and he has a short um, presentation for you. Good evening, council members. My name is Hugh Maughan. I'm Senior Vice President at MBH Partners. Um, thank you for making the time to allow me to present on PFOS. So, just a quick introduction of MBH Partners. So, we have been developing workforce and senior housing for over 25 years. We've developed over 6,000 units in 16 states. We have a number of properties in Illinois, including in Morton, Grand Tool. We have a development under construction in Chicago, and we will start uh, a development in Bloomington, Illinois, probably in March. Uh, here's a map of our national presence. Um, here are a few examples of what our um, developments look like. Here is an aerial of the subject property, so it's monocellable. We um, have the uses to the left and right, and kind the of sports facility and the, the foster inn, and then right beyond that, um, we have some single family homes and then the park across the street. Um, so we think this is a, a good location um, to have some density um, where it's, it's not disconnected from from residential, but there is a buffer from, from the single family homes. And there's also access to amenities like the pharmacy and, and the park. Um, so uh, a little further information about the development. So as Kelly indicated, we have made no changes to the physical structure of the building. It's still going to be 46 units. It will remain 35 one bedroom units 11 two-bedroom units. Um, it, we will also, in the, since the last meeting we did, hearing the feedback we received on the, on the play space for the children, we did add a, a play lot in the back in the northwest corner of the site. So we will have that for, for the children. Um, that said, we don't really anticipate that many children. Again, the 35 one-bedrooms, we don't expect any children. And then 11 two-bedroom units, 
I, I imagine being a handful of children. I don't, I don't really anticipate that many. Um, so we did get a parking analysis from Sam Schwartz Transportation Consultant. Um, they've been doing uh, transportation consulting for 25 years. Um, they have country, uh, offices in Chicago and five other cities across the country. And this is a directly from cut and paste, this, this little table, cut and paste directly from their, the study um, <coughs> for affordable housing uh, in this sort of um, uh, size town. They anticipate that the peak parking demand would be uh, less than just about one uh, parking space uh, at, at the peak on weekdays. Uh, per unit. So that would be uh, a peak demand of 46 parking spaces. We will have 58 parking spaces. We'll have more than enough parking to meet the demand. And a lot of that is due to, again, we, we do have mostly one bedrooms and a, a few two bedrooms. Um, this data is based on the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation 5th Edition. Um, it's based on a lot of data uh, across the country, um, and we, we think it's reliable. And I'm happy to send that study to Cali, who can share it with each of you, if you like. Um, so some of the community benefits, we, this will be um, leading to construction jobs, 35 to 40 construction jobs, two permanent jobs, and that those will be a, an on-site manager, a property manager, and an on-site building technician. And it will meet the demand for quality, affordable housing in the community. Uh, so here's a building elevation. Um, if you were here last year, it, it's exactly the same. It's, it's, a, it's a mix of masonry, brick masonry, and uh, fiber cement board. Um, the great thing about this is this will have an elevator. So um, I, I don't know, I don't think there are many buildings in the area that are have the ADA accessibility and an elevator. We think this would, even though we're removing the age restriction, we think that this could be a great uh, community for, for seniors who, who need the, the elevator and who need ease of access and the accessibility component. So property management, we will, we own and manage the property and we'll do so for the long term. Um, I talked about our, our on-site staff that uh, in addition to the building technician being at the site, he'll also be on call 24-7 to, to deal with emergencies. And then with regard to security features, we'll have electronic key fob, security cameras, and again, the aforementioned on-site staff. So that's um, my quick presentation. I and wanted to address some of the the, uh, some of the concerns I, I heard. So, number of people living in each unit. So, in the bed, in the one bedrooms, that most will have two, a couple to live in the one bedrooms each, and then the two bedrooms. Uh, it could be two, uh, a couple in one bedroom, and then two children potentially. We don't anticipate that each of those will have that many occupants. So, we, we expect it to be a smaller household on average. Um, in terms of the size of the units, the so one bedroom units will be 695 square feet. The two bedroom units will be 907 square feet. So I just wanted to give you a little more accurate information. Um, we will be paying property taxes and this will uh, represent a $12.5 million investment into the community. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions? So there was a question about egress, and I do see just one. What, what did the study say about egress? Or was there a study on egress? Um, we, we haven't heard any concerns about egress. We, we presented this to the city. Kelly, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but um, we think it's sufficient. Why are you coming to us with a, uh, making this more open? With, with, um, sure. 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 So we we apply for funding from the state to, to to build this development. Last year we weren't able to get the funding. Uh, this year they set up the scoring such that um, 
if you're doing senior versus non-senior, you're at a 14 point disadvantage on a 100 point scale. So we don't think we would be competitive for the funding if we want a senior. So that's why we're removing the age restriction. But like I said, the, the building, the physical shape of the building remains. So, and we do still intend to um, market to seniors. Again, because we're moving the age restriction, we can't limit it to seniors, but um, it's, it's not really for families the way it's built. So you, you will manage, your company will manage it, so will you screen, how will you screen, I guess is the better, better question, how do you screen this? Sure, it? so we always do a criminal background check, we do a credit check, we need a landlord reference, um, and then they, each uh, household needs an income qualified. So we do an initial income certification, and we have a, a long list of documents that folks need to provide, and then we do annual recertification. Uh, each household has to sign a, a 12 month lease. Um, and if, and we, al we also have building rules. If people violate those rules, they will be evicted. So we take all that seriously. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we do it. Uh, we also do quarterly inspection agreements. You, you, you said that your investment, your time would be long term involvement with the project. That's you know, right. Once it's completed, what, can you define the long term for me, please? Well, I anticipate at least 30 years. 30 years? Yes. What is your plan for overflow parking if that became a situation? Because I still think if you have a two person household, mm -hmm. and especially if you're opening up to families and so forth, more than likely each one of those individuals is going to have a vehicle. So, um, therefore, you're that, opening up more vehicles and you're already short on space. That's not necessarily our experience for affordable households. Um, it, it, um, we, we have a portfolio of several thousand units. So, um, we don't, and, and we have a, a parking study to back that up. So, I don't anticipate, especially given that if we had a lot of two and three bedrooms, I think that would be a bigger concern. But given that it's 35 one bedroom and 11 two bedrooms, that the unit mix doesn't lend itself to that many cars. Do your developments typically um, take place in areas that do have sidewalks and are in close proximity, say to grocery stores and restaurants? Uh, they, to eliminate the need for the cars? Um, when we're in a more built up environment, mm -hmm. so we, we build from main, from more rural environments where it's very similar to this condition to, I mean, we're doing something in Chicago right now. So it really depends on the environment. If it's a very built up environment, we, you know, walkability is very much a premium. Uh, we understand that in certain situations where they're much more car oriented uh, environments. And so um, we, we understand that. Well, I just don't consider this being an area where they any resident could easily walk to a grocery store. So, I mean, to compare it to the Chicago development. Right, and I, I think most most developments in communities of this size, our folks are relying on their cars mm -hmm. often. So that, that's what we're talking about. How long do you anticipate this to take a bill? About 12 to 14 months. Was that... Uh, you're saying you have five or six construction jobs. That's a lot of work for five or six guys. That's oh. a big building. Yeah. Oh, I, I, 30 I, 40. 30. Yeah, 35, 40. Okay. Thank you. But you said it would provide construction jobs for our area. So you plan on using local contractors if you can? Uh, we plan on at least using local subcontractors to the extent that they, they are there available. I mean, that works, uh, that's beneficial for us because we want to use those same contractors for service maintenance contracts. And it's really hard if we use someone who's far away and we need servicing, it doesn't make sense to hire someone from Chicago for subcontracting. Second reading on this. Is there a second? Second. 
Roll call, please. Mr. Frerichs? No. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Ms. Hardman? Yes. Ms. Vogt? No. Mr. Brock? No. Mr. Burris? This is voting on second reading, correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Mr. Kemp? No. Four, three. Two, four, three, no. Four, three, no, thank you. So we will put this off for a second. Looks like the second reading at our next council. Next council meeting, okay? Thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Thank you.